My father basically raised me from about when I was about four or five. Things sort of started out normal, they're trying to have a family and a house. Then my mother was hospitalized when I was four or five. They didn't talk about what was going on or whatever, but she was in a mental hospital. She was at County General Los Angeles. That's where she met the man who became my stepfather, who was black, and he was in the mental ward as well. The story on him was that he was a returning prisoner of war from Korea, and that he had been tortured. He was the most hopeful person in my life growing up because he was warm and told great stories. And that was the only real feeling of I ever had a family was when he, when he and my, he and my half brother and my mother were together. And that was a place where I could go when I was welcome. My father was pretty upset about being dumped for a black mental patient, which is essentially what happened. So I got to listen to him spew you know, racism about that a lot. I was very aware from age six that the world had to change for my family to stay together because I could tell just walking down the street that the same street, two different days, people look differently at my mother and all of us at our family when my stepfather was in the picture as when he wasn't in the picture. Vern leaves the picture, my stepdad, when I'm 14, really abruptly, really hard, and then life sort of disintegrates from there. And then I was trying to keep my mother together. I'm back to helping mom, but it didn't work, and then one day she wasn't there, she committed herself, and the social workers came from my half-brother and picked him up from daycare, he was four, and took him off kicking and screaming. He was 10 years younger than me, so he was born in 1967 in January. And, uh, you know, he was a baby, he was a joy. And we loved him, you know, my brother and I just loved him and treasured him. My dad, as much venom and racism and hate and everything he spewed around my stepfather, he loved that little boy, you know, he wanted him. He wanted, uh, he wanted him to be adopted. You know, he wanted to adopt him, you know, he just felt terrible about what was happening to him and going through the foster homes and my um, stepmother didn't want to adopt him in part I'm sure some of it was due to racism and some of it was due to the fact that she was like up to here you know she had she was sort of inheriting a family with four just crazy teenagers um, two different families and it was just like that was enough you know and then to bring a seven-year-old who's been in 30 foster home placements you know he was in 35 when I saw him. He was in four years. He was in 35 different foster home placements, according to his record. Yeah. He moved to uh, Greenfield, Massachusetts. So I went back there um, when he was 14. Mostly, what I wanted to tell him was that his father was a good man, because I don't know that he had heard anything good about his father. So I told him um, that his father. Was, in spite of anything that he might have heard, his father was a very, very good man and very important to me and very important in my life. I saw my stepfather on February the 2nd and 3rd in Tallahassee, and he was sick when I got there, and he died three days after I left. And um, so I went back the next week. And so I get some black clothes, show up there. And of course, I'm like the only white person in this church. And so I don't know what the protocol is. So I sit four or five pews back, and they got the whole family. His wife, Carolyn, and my brothers and sisters and everybody in that front pew. And Carolyn gets up and walks back to my pew and says, would you like to sit with the family? And I said, really? And she said, yeah, really. I want to end racism because it destroyed my family, and I don't want it to destroy other people's families. <laughs>